and they become a very unpleasant person. You don't want to be around them. You don't want to go to lunch with them. You know, you know what I'm saying? Don't do that. Now, I could just hold back a little bit and not say these things to you, but I'm, I'm concerned that you would not think as clearly as you should concerning the Bible. Um, so, the first step then in interpreting the Bible correctly is to read the Bible carefully. We're still talking about inductive Bible study. It will help you to always remember that the Bible is God speaking to us. And God is speaking to us, listen to this, through human speech. The theologians say that God accommodates himself to us. It's almost as though, I think John Calvin said, he's, he's speaking baby talk to us. He's speaking in human language to us. Therefore, the rules of, of human language apply to what we read in the Bible. So um, that, that has ramifications as to how we read the Bible. And just that one thought alone explains how, in the past, people have misread the Bible. The Bible is the word of God written in the words of man, human language, the words of men and women. So, uh, that being the case, you already know a lot about how to read the Bible inductively, inductive Bible study. So let me define some terms first of all. Deductive, inductive is the opposite of deductive. Deductive uh, uh, um, Bible reading might be, and, and, the, and deductive reading is not necessarily wrong, it's different. So if you say that, let's say that you, you, you make the statement, God is eternal. Okay. And now you try to find scriptures that support that. And so you would look up different scriptures. Uh, I am in the beginning, I'm the beginning and the end, and, and many, many scriptures. And you can list those scriptures that would prove from the word of God that God is eternal. But you could also take, to do it inductively, you would take a scripture like John 1.1. 1, 1. Gospel of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And from that, we can understand that the Logos is God. In the beginning was the word. The, word, the Greek word for word is Logos. In the beginning was the Logos. That's the name that, that the gospel, John, the evangelist, the writer of the Gospel of John, uh, revealed about the Lord Jesus Christ, that the eternal Son of God from all eternity has been the Logos of God, the Word of God. And this was a, ma a major controversy in the early centuries of the church. Is Jesus God? Or was he created? Was he a created being? Was he just a mirage that appeared and disappeared? And and so from that one scripture, John 1, 1, we could induce from that, well, it clearly tells us the Logos is God. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. So with inductive Bible study, we look at the scripture and ask, what is the scripture telling me? We don't 
put down a thought like God is eternal or God is love, they're both true, and then try to prove it from, from different places in the Bible. We're not trying to deduce something. We are taking a passage and we are asking of the passage, what is this passage telling me? Without projecting my own thoughts onto the passage, without uh, projecting preconceived ideas and conclusions upon the passage, what is the Bible telling me in this passage? So when Bible study is deductive, or you come to a deduction, it's a logical conclusion, okay? Inductive is uh, just attempting to read in the passage what is there. You're not trying to prove something. You're just, you're just letting the Bible speak to you. So, um, the Bible leads you to the conclusion. You don't start with a conclusion and try to prove it. You read the passage and let it lead you to its own conclusions. Now, um, all right, so th this is something that you should have written down in your notes, and that is that the Bible is the Word of God in human speech. It is God speaking to us through human speech, and therefore, the rules of human language and grammar apply. You should have that written down. The rules of human language and grammar apply. We just celebrated National Day in Singapore, August 9th is National Day, and there's a big parade in the Central Business District. A lot of people turn out for that. And if a person were to attend it and, and you ask them all, how, how many people were there? And he said, there was a bazillion, there was millions of people down there. Is that a lie? No. There's only about six million people in all of Singapore. The National Day Parade is in a relatively small part of Singapore. If I come back, you say, well, how many people are there? You say, I said, there was millions, man, they were everywhere. Did I lie? No. <laughs> Were there really millions? No. But did I, so then, what I said was not actually true, was it? But, do we consider that line? No. What, what do we consider that? It's, it's, it's a figure of speech, it's how we talk. In every language, we do that. The, te the technical word, and the Bible does this, regularly, is, it's called hyperbole. And then I gradually dispose of the markers that don't, that don't work. It's called hyperbole. I would write that word down. Hyperbole. Hyperbole is a figure of speech, and it just means, it means conscious exaggeration, conscious exaggeration for the sake of effect. It's not lying. It's human speech. I don't know that I can quote it exactly. There's a place in, is it in Isaiah? Or is it the Psalms? The trees clapped their hands and the little hills skipped like lambs, something like that. Well, do, did the trees really clap their hands? Mm -hmm. Did the lambs, uh, did the hills really skip? 
Is, is that what it means to interpret the Bible literally? If we say, well, every word is inspired, true. And if we're going to interpret the Bible literally as we should, therefore we just have to believe them trees grew hands and those hills skipped like lambs. Is that, is that right? You know, I was in Barrio. Do you, you all know bar, where Barrio is and the revival that happened there. I was there on the 40th anniversary of that revival with Pastor Philip. Pastor Philip and I went, Mary went, and uh, Pastor Nancy went, and you know, that is the closest I've ever seen to trees clapping, you know, clapping their hands. I mean, the way the wind blew there through the trees, it, it almost looked like the trees clapped their hands, but they didn't have hands, obviously. What kind of speech is that? It's poetry. It's poetic speech. Is poetry part of human speech? Yes. Actually, to interpret the Bible literally means to take into account such things as figures of speech. Poetry. Is there symbolism in the Bible? Absolutely. There is symbolism in the Bible. And now, when you, when you pick up a newspaper, you read that newspaper one way because there's automatically a switch in your brain that turns on and says, I'm reading a newspaper right now. But if you are in the medical profession and you pick up a text on some aspect of the practice of medicine, you read that text in another way. And if you pick up uh, uh, Shakespeare, you read him in another way. If you pick up a book of poetry, you read that in another way. If you like science fiction and you start reading science fiction, you read that in a different way. No one has to tell you. You know automatically that you need to adjust for the kind of material that you're reading. We call that, we call that genre. Genre, it's just the type of literature. You don't read poetry the way you would read a medical textbook. Now, later, when we get to Mark chapter one and we start doing some inductive Bible study, I going to stick my neck out and say that you probably find some hyperbole in there. And you need to be aware of that. Uh, genre is important because when you're reading the Word of God, it's the Word of God in the words of men, and therefore the rules of language and grammar apply. To interpret the Bible literally means to take into account things like figures of speech, and the type of literature or genre. You do it automatically uh, out on the, you know, in everyday life. Many times people want to read symbolism into things that are not symbolic at, at all. They're trying to find a hidden meaning, a different meaning. And then sometimes people take uh, some language in the Bible which is, is intended to be symbolic they take that as actual. The problem is we're not distinguishing what kind of genre it is. Now, so different rules apply to different kinds of literature. The Bible is one book consisting of how many books are in the Bible? 66 books total. How many in the Old Testament? Anyone know? There's 39. 39 here, 39 there, 39 once, 39 twice, going, going, 39. All right, now, for those of you that are mathematically gifted, if there's a total of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, how many are in the New? 27. These books represent different kinds of literature. Let's just think, 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 think. By the way, one of my main objectives in this class is to get people to think about the Bible the way they think at their job. 
because we definitely use our brains on our job. We're constantly processing, thinking, studying, analyzing, and I want them to do that with the Bible. Because God gave us our brains for a purpose. It's not all spiritual. Of course it is spiritual. We do depend heavily on the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and to guide us as we read. Surely that is important. He is our teacher. In Luke 24, the disciples did not understand the Bible until Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And nevertheless, the most gifted uh, people in the body of Christ through history were, were people who applied themselves wholly to comprehend the word of God. Psalm 111 verse 2 is one of my favorite verses. It says, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all those who delight in them. And I'll tell you this, there is a reward for those who will think deeply about the word of God because it is basically meditation. And what did Joshua 1 8 say? So shall you make your way prosperous, so shall you have good success. The, the godly man of Psalm 1, his delight is what? In the law of the Lord, in the Torah, in the instruction of God, in the word of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his word that he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water, who yields his fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Amen. Now, that, now some of that applies to your outward life. And there surely is a reward for studying the Word of God deeply in the outward life. But in your inward life, your relationship with the Lord, there are such riches available to those who will mine for them and look for them. And the way you do this is through inductive Bible study. Now, different rules apply to different kinds of literature. Let's just think, think, think. What kinds of literature are in the Bible? And um, I, I don't care if you use the technical term. Just use any, any word you can think of to describe uh, portions of the Bible that seem to be different from other portions, okay? Now, I'm not going to let Brother David answer this one because he's too smart. He's going to give us the answer. Who can tell me one form of literature that's in the Bible? What, who said that? What? Narrative. Narrative. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Narrative. What's an example of narrative, brother? A story of the birth of Jesus. Any story, isn't it? A narrative is basically uh, his, it's, it's a recitation of facts. It's history. That's another name for narrative, is historical. There's, there's uh, let's write some of these down. Okay, so these are types of genre. We, we have one narrative. Okay, someone else. What's another kind of literature that's in the Bible? Who said that? Who said that? Did you say that? Prophecy, give me an example of that. Book of da Daniel, yeah. Uh, well, Daniel does have prophecy. And sometimes books of the Bible have more than one type of genre. Uh, there's another genre in Daniel. There's some fairly interesting symbolism there. And in Ezekiel, have you ever read Ezekiel? Do you understand Ezekiel? I don't. There's a lot of Ezekiel I do not understand. The wheel within the wheel and how these beings are moving and so on. But I will say this, when you read passages like that, even though you don't understand them with your mind, your spirit is edified. Because there's pictures of heaven in the book of Ezekiel. There's pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ that we don't usually think of. We usually think of him as the good shepherd with the lamb around his shoulders. But in the book of Ezekiel, you've got fire coming out of them. Right? 
It's good to read books like that. It's good to read things in the Bible that you don't understand. You know, if God is who he says he is, there's going to be a lot of things he talks about that you don't understand. Amen? And we just got to get used to that. When I was in Bible school, I really thought that I would know it all. I am here to master all of the Word of God and to understand it all. And I'm so glad I got set free from that because I realized there's just all kinds of places in the Bible that you hit. You, you, you stop and have to think, I have no idea what that means. There's a, there's a hundred dollar word that I'll, if you remind me, I'll try to share it with you tomorrow. After six years of seminary, that one word is one of the best things I've learned in six years of seminary. So if you're interested, you remember and ask me about that. We won't talk about it now. Okay, prophecy, but there's that other kind of literature in there. Anybody know what it is? It's like a lot of symbolism. So I, I would say apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Okay, so narrative is like history. And we have an example, the birth of Christ. What's, what else? How about Noah's Ark? Uh, Abraham and Isaac going up the mount. The Exodus. The stories in the Gospels and so on and so forth. Uh, what else? What other kind of literature do we have? Parables. Parables. And parables are what? What kind of literature are the parables? What do we find in the parables? Illustrations, Illustrations but something else. Commandments. Commandments. Mm -hmm. I can't hear you <laughs> because of the air conditioning unit. So what I like to ask the students is if you would just talk loud enough that they could hear you in Kuching, then I will probably hear you. Okay? So we're in a Bible school and Bible is all about proclamation. Say that again. What what is, what do you find in the parables? Commandments. Everyday what? Commandments and laws. Uh, commandments and laws. Wow, there's a there's a just a real simple word here. Uh, it's wisdom literature. You find wisdom, okay? And this would, this would apply to what books? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the book of James, interestingly. Have you ever noticed that the book of James reads like the Proverbs? Have you ever noticed that? The book of James? Well, you will. When you read the book of James from now on, you'll notice it. It's very uh, punchy. It's the, the, the book of Proverbs is it's just one proverb after another. And sometimes there's continuity. There's a continuous line of thought from the beginning to the end of the chapter. Sometimes it's just one punchline after another. It's because it's wisdom literature. All right. I can't think of other. OK. I'm, I'm, yeah. OK. There's another big category. What is it? We've already talked about it. The trees clap their hands. Poetry. Okay. What book has a lot of poetry? Psalms. But do you know what? Um, by the way, do you know which book of the Bible Jesus quoted more than any other? Somebody said Isaiah. No? Who said that? I heard you. Very good. Very good. You're right. Was that a guess or did you know that? You knew that. Okay. Now, that was a mistake because now I'm going to call on you a lot because I know how smart you are. I won't. Don't worry. Don't worry. Come back tomorrow. Don't let me scare you. I'm not. Okay. Psalms. He quoted Psalms more than any other book of the Bible. Isn't that interesting? Do you know, when you think about all the reading you have to do for this course, I just read about this man, he's um, just not long ago. I think his name, I, I can't, uh, uh, but he was a scholar in the last hundred years. And his closest friends said that he 
not only memorized the entire Bible, the entire Bible. They said he knew the whole Bible by heart in various English translations, not just one translation. But that's not all. They say he also memorized it in the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. Aren't you glad I didn't make that a requirement? <laughs> now you will read those chapters with joy. You'll be so grateful. But that brings me back to the book of Psalms. And then, and then Martin Luther, the great reformer, he knew the book of Psalms by heart. You know what? Walking, with, what, you get spoiled with wireless microphones because I'm getting so tangled up with this thing. You have to learn how to walk with a microphone again. I stepped on my shoelace. Okay, so Luther knew Psalms. When he was a monk, they would recite the Psalms, I think, three times a day, every day. So he knew them by heart. Guess who else surely knew all the Psalms by heart? What do you think? Jesus, Jesus the Lord Jesus. He quoted them, he recited them, and he said, they're about me. Did you know that? He said, the Psalms... The, the, the prophets and the law are about me. And that's why we want to read the Bible with Christ-centered glasses on. We want to read it to see Christ. The Bible is 66 books, but they're not disconnected. The Bible is not just a series of disconnected uh, stories that have no connection. There is a unifying thread through the entire Bible, and his name is Jesus. And when we come back from the break, we'll, we will talk about that. What is the great, the big story that underlies all the other stories in the Bible? And we'll also come back and, and finish this discussion, okay? So, let's take 10 minutes, right? 10 minute break, Jen. Okay.